because we've got so many swimmers in our church. And um, have you ever been at the swimming pools or at the beach or anywhere and you go and you've done the competition to see who can hold their breath the longest? How many of you have done that? Raise your hand. You've done that with someone before. Say, well, I'm going to hold my breath longer than you. And you started to do it. How many of you have been underwater? How many of you know what I'm talking about? And then you, you think you're going to die. You know, you're like, it's, it's no longer a joke. You, you like, you're starting to lose consciousness, but you're like, I will not lose. I prefer to die than, than lose. And I've done that many times. It's been very, very stupid on my behalf. I think Jem is probably the one that could probably hold her breath the longest because we had a swimming battle and, and I can't remember who won that. Uh, but when you swim out, you can try and hold your breath and that's, that's great. But I wanted to think about it. How long can you hold your breath for? How long? Some people, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 60 seconds. They say on average, most people can hold their breath for 90 seconds. I tried doing that. That's a very long time. After about 20, I'm like, yo, time out. I'm done. But there's a difference between holding your breath and someone who's a scuba diver. A scuba diver can go down into the water and they, hold their breath. they don't have to hold their breath. They've got an external oxygen tank. And what happens actually when they're scuba diving, the deepest that, they, that someone's gone scuba diving is 300 and 32 meters deep into the sea. Think about how deep that, that is serious depth. How long's the rugby field? 80, 90 meters. This is over three of them, and they went down that deep. Now, if I asked you to do that without an oxygen tank, no one could do that, right? If I told you to go 10 meters deep, most of us could say, probably, Pastor, I, I don't think I can do that. We need to stay in the shallows. But if you've got an oxygen tank, you can go deep. I say that to say this, how deep are you in the will, destiny, and purposes of God? Are you a scuba diver Christian that can get deep into the deep things that God has called us to do, deeper than the average? Or are you a surface level Christian that we just stay on the surface, we dabble a little bit with, with Sunday worship, maybe even Wednesday worship, but there's no depth to your Christianity? Why are some people deep in their faith? Then there are other people that are shallow in their faith. Why is that? Well, I believe this is the answer. Your dependency determines your depth. Your dependency on God determines how deep you will go with Him. Christians that go deep with God, it's not in their own strength. They have an external source, just like the scuba divers, and their external source is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the one that gives us breath to go deeper in the things of God. And the surface Christians are those that depend on their own abilities talents and strength. So I want to preach this, this uh, evening a sermon I've entitled Scuba Diver Christians. And my prayer is that we will be men and women that go deep in the things of God. How many want to go deep in the plans of God? Say amen. amen. And that's our plan this evening. Let's look at John 20, some words of Jesus. The Bible says this. So Jesus said to them, verse 21, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. God, we're grateful for your word. Lord, I'm asking you, God, that we can go to deeper levels with you. God, help us to get out of our comfort zone and just in the shallow pool of your plans, God. But let us get into the deep waters that you've called us out to, Lord. God, let us be obedient to your will, your purpose, and your plans. Thank you for the, tonight, God. Fill us again with the Holy Spirit. God, give us this depth that we so desperately need. We give you all the glory and all the praise in the mighty name of Jesus. Everybody says, amen. amen. Let's look firstly at desire, our desires. You know, when you go underwater, either at the beach or at, in a pool or wherever you go underwater in your bathtub, it's a different world underwater than above water. The oxygen is different. Now we're on top of the water. Everyone could breathe freely. You're saying, Pastor, I got a mask. I feel like I'm dying. I understand. I'm sorry. We'll get out of this suit. But underwater, have you ever tried breathing underwater? Yeah, good luck with that. It's not, it's not going to work because the oxygen levels are different because it's different underwater. Gravity is different underwater. Plants are different underwater. Animals are different underwater. You won't see a lion just walking around underwater. It's, that's weird. Be uh, we Beck and I, we took Isaiah to the aquarium and there's this like stingray flying over. It's, and Isaiah is freaking out at all these animals. In fact, at one point, he was more happy to see the, the fish on the, on the poster than the fish in the tank. And I'm like, I, I paid $30. And he's like, look, Dad. I'm like, look at this, man. Oh, my goodness. But it's a totally different world. Weapons are different above water and underwater. It's a totally different world underwater. The reason I say that is because the kingdom and will of God 
is another world. You can't run in the kingdom the same way you run on the kingdom of earth. You can't treat the kingdom of God the same way you, keep the, you treat the kingdom of earth. It's a spiritual world. You have spiritual oxygen. You have spiritual weapons. You have spiritual gravity. You have a spiritual plan. It's completely different. Just like living above water and underwater is completely different. Living in the kingdom of God and living in the kingdom of man is completely different. So in our text, Jesus is actually sending out his disciples. Look what he says in verse 21. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you as the father has sent me, I also send you. Here he is training his disciples. And this is incredible time. Training his disciples for three years, but now it's go time. This is, uh, this is John 21. John 22 is the final chapter of John, Jesus ascends. But before he ascends into heaven, he made sure that his disciples were gonna enter into destiny. Listen, church, we just had conference and it was a great time. If you're able to watch any of them, I encourage you to watch as many as you can. And it stirred me up, stirred me up. We sent out churches, sent a new church here into Wellington, Caleb Spruce, and some of you know him and I can't wait until he comes over. He did a powerful work just in one year in Craigieburn in Victoria and he's gonna come over very soon. But it's more than just sending out churches, it's releasing people into destiny. That's why conference is so important. That's why we need to be at as many conferences as we can because it's not just about what churches are we sending out. It's about releasing people into destiny. We have 17 sermons in conference challenging us about our calling, challenging us about our plans and our purposes, inspiring us, equipping us, uh, inspire, uh, uh, challenging us to higher levels. And the reason for all of that is we must understand this. Jesus wants to send you out into your destiny. He wants to send you out into his destiny. This is vital for Jesus. In Jesus' eyes, this is the most important thing in his eyes. Can I just say, Jesus is not satisfied in just saving you. That's not enough. I know in our eyes, salvation is a miracle, and it is a miracle, and we're glad you're saved. But when you pray the altar, <laughs> that's, that's level one. That's, you haven't done anything. God did everything. And now he wants to step you into destiny. Think about weddings, and I'm looking forward to Dylan and Cole's wedding. But the wedding and a marriage is not the plan. It's not you get a wedding day, and then that's it. Oh, we got married, and that's it. There's no relationship afterwards. There's no raising a family. There's no nothing. No, no. You get married so you can raise a family, so you can develop relationship. You have a future together for the rest of your life. It is not just say some things in an altar and then just be gone with it. No, no. It is togetherness forever. Think about children, when you, when you have a child, it's not, hey, we had kids and now I'm done with them. Although, <laughs> ever had those nights? I'm done, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. Beck was done before she, anyway, anyway. So, the reason we have it is because there's a purpose and a future. Listen, salvation is not just about that prayer that you prayed. It's about entering into your destiny. Jesus is not satisfied with just saving you. And well done, you're saved. No, Jesus, okay, you're saved. Now enter into destiny. Think about the first words of Jesus' ministry. And the first words in the Bible are very important. And look what he says in Matthew 4, 17. It says, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Think about this. Repent, the call is repentance. And we, pray, we, we, we make that call every service because that's what Jesus did. But it wasn't necessarily repent because you're gonna go to hell. It wasn't repent because there's some, you can have a better life. It was repent because there's a kingdom of God that you need to be part of. That's the whole purpose of repentance. It's not just to save us from hell, which is a great side blessing. That, that, that's pretty good. But Jesus' first words were, it wasn't repent so you don't go to hell and just go to heaven. It's repent because there's a kingdom and he wants you to be part of his kingdom and he has a plan for your life. Listen, in Jesus' eyes, there is nothing more important than the will of God. Nothing. Everyone say nothing. nothing. In the Greek, nothing means nothing. Nothing. Nothing's more important. What about my family? Well, Jesus told us, Luke 9, 59. Then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go preach the kingdom of God. Now imagine if you came to me. <laughs> Pastor, I'm coming. Uh, I can't make it to church tonight. I'm just gonna go bury my dad but uh, definitely this weekend. And I said, let the dead bury the dead. You'd be like, I'm never coming back to this church ever again. But the, the point wasn't the burial. The point was his priorities was earthly instead of heavenly. 
And here in Jesus' eyes, listen, nothing, nothing's more important than the kingdom. It's not about getting people saved, and that, that is good. But now that you're saved, you must be part of the kingdom. Someone said this, being a Christian is less about cautiously avoiding sin than courageously and actively doing God's will. Because some people, they think my calling is just, just to stay saved. <laughs> That's not biblical at all. Our calling is not, I just better not sin. No, no, it's that you can be courageous in the will of God. That you can step into what he has for you. Think about Jesus in the garden. Incredible, man. This is incredible insight into his life. And here is Jesus in the garden, sweating great drops of blood. The most, the most fragile Jesus is in his whole earthly ministry. And he says, God, take this cup away from me, but not my will. Your will. This is so deep. Here is Jesus. Like, none of us have been that stressed before. But in that deepest moment, Jesus understood the most important thing in my life is the will of God. Oh, church, I, how important is the will of God to you? Not it just coming to church and being part of a congregation. And listen, I'm glad, I'm glad for that. But how important is I am going to actively pursue the destiny that God has for me? You know, one of, what's one of the main reasons why people don't do the will of God? And we, it's, for us, it's all the same. Why, why won't we step up into the will of God? I can't do it, right? That's our first response to everything. Do you want to join this ministry? Oh, I'm not sure if I can do it. Can you step up into this? I, I, I can't do it. It's too hard. But it's only too hard if you depend on your method. Now think, again, let's go back to the scuba diving stuff. If I told you to swim 50 meters de- down into the sea, you'd be like, I, I can't do that. But if I told you, listen, we're going to rig you up with some scuba diving equipment. You're going to have an oxygen tank. We're going to have people train you. In fact, the whole time, someone's going to be with you the whole way down, and they're never going to leave your side. All of us would be like, yeah, keen. Because it's, we have an external source, and we have someone with us. But when we call, say things like, would you step up into ministry, or we step into the plans of God, we're not thinking about the Holy Spirit, about God joining us. We're thinking about our own abilities and our own talents. But you can't live like that. We need to be scuba diver Christians that we depend on the Holy Spirit to get us through. You say amen? Amen. Listen, you aren't supposed to do the will of God without external equipment. You're not supposed to do it in your own strength. You're not supposed to dive to the bottom of the ocean just holding your breath. That's, that's, That's insanity. But how insane is it to think that some Christians, they're trying to do it in their own strength. I depend on me and my abilities and my people skills and my leadership to get rid of all of that, depend on the Holy Ghost. Jesus said, peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So before going deep in God, you need the Spirit of God. This is why we sing songs about the Holy Spirit. That's why I preach on the Holy Spirit. That's why we pray for the Holy Spirit. Can I also say, in scuba diving, it doesn't matter about your lung capacity. Maybe we're going to go diving, and you're like, oh, I can't hold my breath for long. And you look at them, and you want to slap them. You have an oxygen thing in your mouth, doofus. You know what I mean? Or like Pastor Ernie Tom would say, you donut. It's such a good insult. Yeah, donut. Anyway, back in the UK, me and Gunny used to say that all the time. But here he is. That, that, that's insanity. Listen, people with an amputated leg can still scuba dive. Short people can scuba dive. Tall people can scuba dive. People with asthma problems can scuba dive. Anyone can. Whether you're young or whether you're old, you can still scuba dive. Because it doesn't depend on you. You have an external source. So it doesn't matter your strength, church. You can do the will of God. He is our strength. And so stop looking at your own abilities and your talents and what you can do. Do you know that Pastor Mitchell pastored six churches that weren't good before he took over the Prescott Church? Six. That's a lot. And none of them really took off. And when he took the Prescott Church, it was his broken church. The pastor slept with people in the church and the pastor's son slept with people in the church. Imagine that. Hey, we've got a great church for you. And uh, they've had a few issues. What's the issues? Oh, the pastor was sleeping around. Oh, well, at least the son was good. No, no, the son was sleeping around. They're like, what? What kind of church is this? That's the foundation of the Potter's House Church. Because when that church decided to focus on the Holy Spirit, then look at the breakthrough worldwide. It's incredible. So how, old, how long can you hold your breath for? Let's say 90 seconds, okay? The world record is 24 minutes. Now, I don't even know how you can do that. I, I don't know how that works. The world record for, for being underwater with an oxygen tank is 51 hours. So the best that we can do humanly is 24 hours, uh, 24 minutes. But the best that you could do with oxygen tank is 51 hours, 127 times more. 
Would you like to be 120, 127 times greater for God? 120, not one or two times better, not just a bit better, 127. Or if we did it on the 90 seconds, like most of us, that's 2,040 times better than average. Because that's the level God's calling us to go. That's the depths that God wants to take us. But if we're depending on our own strength, we can't get anywhere. Jesus said, tarry in Jerusalem until you have the power of the Holy Spirit. And remember who he's talking to, to the disciples that trained with Jesus, that were pastored by Jesus, discipled by Jesus. And he says, look, you have all the ability, but that's not enough. You better be filled with the Holy Spirit before you do something for God. And that should be our call. Because in reality, church, can we be honest? There's a lot of shallow Christians out there. And like, look, I, I, I don't, and I'm not gonna mock other churches and praise God for them. But it's frustrating me how weak many of their disciples are. It just frustrates me. So what, what did your church do during the lockdown? Oh, we weren't really having church or something. Just weak. Meeting Christians out and we, we had a, um, hey, there's a bird here, praise the God. Uh, make sure it doesn't pull on anyone's head. So um, we, we, had, we had the, the youth camp and I remember we were out at this campsite. It was another Christian and, and uh, he comes and, and he, he's with this other guy. And then he said, do you mind if we pray before we start? I was like, yeah, of course. So we all gathered to, together. It's actually the men, we had just the men. And we prayed and we called on God and we're praying out in tongues. And then the guy comes up to me afterwards. He's like, how do, how do you get your youth to pray like that? And I was like, this is normal. What do you mean? How do I get them to pray like this? He's like, our youth don't pray like that. And he, his mind was blown because he saw people filled with the Holy Spirit. And this needs to be our, our church, be Holy Spirit filled people. Think about this church. What's our, what's our theme for the year? How are we gonna arise in our own strength? It has to be through the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at Jeremiah 17, verse five to nine. Thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength whose heart departs from the Lord. Listen, if you trust in your own strength, ultimately your heart is gonna depart from the Lord. This is deep, man. Then he goes on, for he shall be like a shrub in the desert. <laughs> your shrub, like it's so funny. He shall not see when good comes. How's it interesting is that? That even when God wants to bless you, if you trust in your own strength, you're not gonna see the good, but inhabit a parched place in the wilderness in a salt land which is not inhabited. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, who spreads out its roots by the river. He will not fear when heat comes, his leaf will be green. He will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor cease from yielding fruit. That's what happens when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Heat comes, bring it, I'm good. I'm not worried. You could still produce fruit in a droughting season. How many know in the lockdown, many of you were still going strong in the lockdown, why? Because we are not relying on external sources here on earth. We're relying on a heavenly vision, a heavenly mandate. And that is the air that we get in our lungs. It is the Holy Spirit. And that's what gives us strength. It's funny at the end of this scripture, it's all about if you trust in yourself, it's gonna end bad. You trust in God, you're gonna be blessed. Then it says, verse nine, we all know this verse. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? Now, why is that verse tied to these scriptures, right? Context. Now, what he's trying to say here is that in our mind and our heart, there's still something in us that says, but I wanna trust in myself. Even though you can have God Almighty, because our hearts are wicked, we trust in ourselves. So my question is, how deep do you wanna go? Maybe how deep are you today? Because everyone wants to go deeper, I'd say, but not everyone wants to depend wholeheartedly. We know that song, Oceans, and it's not my favorite song. But listen, if you're gonna sing that song, you better be prepared to go into some deep water. You better, if you say, God, take me deeper, then my feet can never wander. You better be prepared to get uh, put through the cycle of life and not know how life is gonna turn out and still trust in the Lord. So let's close with Dominion. And don't we all need dominion? You say amen. amen. Someone said this, the people with the most dominion in life are those who depend wholeheartedly on God. And that needs to be us. We need to depend wholeheartedly on God. So how do we get dominion? Number one, realize your weakness. Realize your weakness. We can do nothing without God. Nothing without God. Don't even try and attempt anything without God. Realize that there is nothing good inside of us. 
nothing good inside of us. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things, but it's only through Christ who strengthens me. And this all things is not like, yeah, I could be the man. It means when t- times are tough, I can be strong. That's what he's actually talking about in that text. And we use, people use that for sport. I can do all things, yeah, for Jesus. Yeah, I'm gonna score a try in Jesus' name. No, you moron. <laughs> Absolutely not. They're swearing the whole game and then, and you, you were drinking. You were drinking with all the boys and then you're gonna get, anyway. Don't, don't, I'm not, not going there. Not going there. The key to life is knowing that you're weak. You know, the weakest Christians are actually the strongest Christians. It's the ones that think they're strong that are actually weak. The ones that'll be like, pastor, I'll never backslide. Okay, I'll just put it in my diary now. This guy's gonna backslide. (laughs) Nearly every person who said, pastor, I will never. They always. But you should say like, Paul, by the grace of God, I am that I am. By the grace and power of God. Matthew 5, 3, this is the Beatitudes. says, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Another translation says who depend only on him. This is a deep scripture and I could preach a whole sermon from this. Think about this. When you realize your need for God, the kingdom of heaven is yours. That's deep, man. The whole kingdom of heaven belongs to you when you realize I am nothing without God. When God called Moses and Jeremiah, always, I can't do it, I'm too young, I can't speak because they focused on themselves. We sang tonight, right? Mighty you are. We didn't sing mighty I am. God, uh, you've heard me say this so many times, God is so great, he doesn't need you to be great. Just be weak. He, you're good, just stay weak, stay soft, and depend wholeheartedly on him, and you'll be fine. Realize your weakness. But people say, pastor, I can't do it. I'm like, yeah, I know. 100% you can't do it. I didn't ask you to do something because you could. I asked you to do something so you can depend on God. So what are some things that God's challenging you about that you've made in the past? I can't do it. Realize, yeah, I can't. I can't witness without God. I can't step into ministry without God. I can't pioneer. I can't preach. Whatever your ministry is, whatever God's called you to do, realize you can't do it without our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So number one, realize your weakness. Number two is rely on Jesus. Make him your source of strength. Prayer, Bible reading, worship, coming to church. You know, if, if we don't depend on Jesus, we're, we're in big trouble, aren't we? Pastor Glenn Clark, I remember we were in prayer one time in Footscray. It's probably about 10 years ago now. I was in the prayer room. You know how prayer rooms go up and down. And it was good to have people in the prayer room tonight. You know, it's, I can't, it's so good praying together, isn't it? And I remember I was in Footscray, went up and then it came down. And I heard him pray. I heard him pray and he said, Lord, I have no confidence in myself or in my flesh, but I have full confidence in the power and dominion of the Holy Spirit. And it was like, boom. I'm like, stealing that for sure. And I've been using that prayer for the last 10 years. And here is Pastor Glenn Clark, one of the most powerful preachers. Some of you have heard him preach, just on fire for God, just just full of the Holy Ghost and dominion and power and strength. And he says, I have no confidence in who I am. My my confidence is not in my abilities or my ability to speak and, and persuade a crowd, but I have full confidence when the Holy Spirit comes, everything changes. And we must rely wholeheartedly on him. So I have a question for you. When was the last time you went into some deep water for Jesus? When was the last time you stepped out and did something that you thought, man, I can't do this by myself? When was the last time we got out of the boat like Peter? When was the last time we did something and I was like, I, man, if Jesus doesn't show up, I'm gonna look really bad. That's how you receive power. Psalm 146 verse five, the Lord, of, the Lord God of Jacob blesses everyone who trusts him and depends on him. So let's close with the four blessings that you, do, that you get when you trust and depend wholeheartedly on God when you become a scuba diver Christian. Number one is that you receive strength. How many like a bit more strength in the life? Say amen. amen. Psalm 125 verse one says, those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which can never be shaken. It remains firm forever. Man, imagine if someone told you, man, you're like Mount Zion. You're like Mangry Mountain, my brother. That, that one of the greatest blessings you could ever receive. Or you're like Mount the Gardens. What, I'm not sure what's out there. I've got to find what's going on. But he says, you are unshakable. You're unsha- and I know people like this, that no matter what comes, rain comes, wind comes, storms comes, thunder comes, exactly the same. Unshaken, unshaken. There's a death in the family, unshaken. Someone leaves the church, unshaken. 
When there's financial situations, unshaken. Why? Because they're trusting in the Lord. And you will get strength here. Billy Graham said this, the will of God will not take us where the grace of God cannot sustain us. So if God's calling you somewhere, grace, grace, it is unmerited favor, but another way to remember grace is spiritual empowerment. Think of grace as power. And so when God calls you somewhere, he's gonna give you grace and power to do what he's called you to do. But God's not gonna say, come out of the boat and then purposely make you, make you sink. Peter only sunk because he took his eyes off Jesus, right? God, God's not build-ups. Come out of the water, we take a step, and he's like, ha, ha. Like, he's not, not gonna do that to us. If he calls you to do something, just trust him, and he's gonna see us through, amen? Again, I told you this story, but last time I was in Footscray, I had someone come up to me and says, Dan, you're, you're a completely different person. And the reason I say that is so you guys realize that this is not who I was when I first went out. There was weakness, there was fear, there was, there was struggles, there was all sorts of things that, that I had to go through when I got sent out. But because I've trusted in God, God has given me strength. And God could do the same for you. Pastor Mitchell said so many times, right? Christianity is not about what you are today, but it's what you can become in Christ. So when you depend on him, you get strength. Number two is that you experience the supernatural. You experience supernatural things. Now, when you go scuba diving, is that on top of the water, there's nothing really fancy about water. You know, you might look over a view, like, man, the water looks cool. But when you go under the water and see, like, amazing photos, like the reef and the, and the fish that is underwater, it's, a, it's incredible. Then we've got some photos here. This is, some of these are from the Great Barrier Reef off the side, off this coast of Australia. But you get these beautiful pictures of what's actually under depths of the ocean. You can go through them. I'll show you how many I sent. It's like, like we're finding Nemo, right? We're right there. That's like, it's like you can go do it for your own life. It's, like, it's, it's so cool. These beautiful fish, beautiful creatures, beautiful things in the depths of the ocean. Church, that's only available to people that go deep. You want some beauty in life? You want to experience some supernatural things in life? You got to go deep, man. If you stay in the shallows, what do you get? Sand. You get sand in anything that comes, <laughs> comes through. It depends what beach you're at. Only Hunger Bay, it doesn't matter. I don't know what kind of happens. But when you go deep, man, you experience some pretty crazy things. The disciples, weak and timid, then they, then they got filled with the Holy Spirit and just turned the world upside down. And that could be you and I. You could be a weak Christian today, but I'm telling you, you get filled with the Holy Spirit, you can experience miraculous power, just like our brother Chaz. Chaz prayed for someone and they, and they raised from the dead. Like who experiences that? Who even prays for that? Most people won't even have, have enough faith to pray for that. But he did it and God did a miracle. I remember when I was at the hospital, I'm praying for this baby, couldn't breathe properly and I just prayed and it was a weak prayer. I'm not, I, I didn't have much faith. Because have you ever been in a hospital in an ICU ward? Like, it's not the most faith-filled area. And I'm going there by myself to meet someone I don't know to pray for their kid. I go and I pray, and I'm like, God, you need to do a miracle. I pray for like 30 seconds, quietly, because it's like awkward. Prayed, didn't hear back for like three years. Three years later, she finds, me, finds us online, sends an email, says my, my, my daughter got healed the next day and came out of ICU. Because you experience miracle power, miracle power. All that, can I just say, all of that is impossible if you want to stay in the shallows. You miss all of that goodness, amen. Number three is success. Was Jim Elliott a failure? He built no church, had no disciples. His missionary journey, building his church, lasted six days. And him, four other brothers, all died that day. Now, my question, was he a failure or was he a success? Of course it's a success because there is no failure in the will of God and there is no success outside the will of God. You could be outside the will of God and make a million dollars. You are the biggest failure ever. What would it profit a man if he gains the whole world but lost his soul? The will of God is where it's all out. A.W. Tozer said, the spirit-filled life is not a special deluxe edition of Christianity. It's not like you got the deluxe album. Oh, you guys don't understand albums these days. Like if you bought the Usher album back in the day, you can get the deluxe and you can get like 17 tracks instead of 12. It says, it is part and parcel of the total plan for God and his people. God wants to give you success and supernatural blessing. And finally, there is safety. Deep water is a little scary. Most of us, if we were out at sea, even Jem, I'm sure, will have her moments. But yeah, I see, it's like, oh, I'm just gonna jump into the ocean. No. I remember one of my friends, he, 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 we hired a boat and we went out to the beach. We we're driving out and he's like, let's go jump off. I'm like, yeah, I'm not too sure about that. I don't know what's under there and they might eat my legs first. I'm, I'm, it's, it's a bit scary. 
And how many know, like, when God calls us out into the deep, it's, it can be a bit scary sometimes. It's supposed to be scary when you realize that God is our strength. Look what he says in our text. Peace to you. Peace to you. You know, in fact, the only people that need to be worried are the people that are outside the will of God. But when you're in the will of God, bring it. Let's go. Let's do this. It's exciting because God is going to be with us. The safest place in the world is the will of God. Maybe you're saying, Pastor, I feel out of my depth. Yes. That's the whole point. Listen to oceans. All right. Play it and reap it. Get in your head. We need to be outside of the shallows. That's where God wants you. Look at 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you and my strength is made perfect when in weakness i'm telling you church the times i've been strongest for god is when i've been weakest in my flesh it's when i've been in those moments god i don't know how this is going to work and that's when god comes and does miracles so as i close how deep are you willing to go in the plans of god are you willing to put your feet into some waters that are a little cold a little scary a little different, could be in your calling or your faith, your destiny, whatever it is. Maybe you're holding back a little bit. And we all, we've all done that, right? Put our toes in the will of God. Oh, it's a bit cold. Now I'll just, I'll just hang out here. But God wants to take us deeper. God wants to take us further. Let go of the edge. Let's go deep in the things of God, man. Imagine where God can take us. I was talking with Pastor Chris. He's got his building. It's got a core of people coming along. I think he had about 20-odd people this morning. He sent me a photo because he went into the deep. What can God do with your life if you went into the deep? I love this scripture. I'm going to close with this scripture. This is a beautiful scripture. Remember this scripture. Psalm 107, verse 24. They see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. You want to see wonders? You've got to go out into the deep. You've got to put yourself in positions where you're a little bit uncomfortable. But you see wonders. You see the works of the Lord. So let's get out of the shallows. Let's stop getting our ankles wet. Let's go all in. Let's just jump in. Jesus is coming back soon. Might as well rapture us when we're right in the deep end. He's going to save us. Amen. Why don't we give God praise together? Let's give God all the glory. Thank you, Jesus, for your power, your grace, and your dominion, Lord. Glory and honor and power. Be unto God who reigns forever. Well, God, we honor you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray.